Thank you everyone for joining us here today on the Trail of Honor to remember and honor those 23 souls lost on the USS Westchester County LST 1167 on 1 November 1968, 56 years ago today. I am Cynthia Kaufman and with me is Deborah Palazzo. We are the co-founders of the Daughters of Liberty's Legacy. In 2018, we had the honor of meeting the survivors of the USS Westchester County, also known as the Westco and helping them to honor their fallen compatriots in a ceremony here at Lasden Park. Memorial stones were laid in front of the museum here. When they asked us to help with this memorial on the Trail of Honor, we were honored to do so. I would like to bring up Corporal Bob Wynn, United States Marine Corps, from the Commandant's own Drum and Bugle Corps for the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Please all rise and recite with me the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Pray, Heavenly Father. We have gathered together this day to remember those who preserved as results of mining of the USS Westchester County on November 1st, 1968. Hear us, O Lord, as we make our appeal in their memory. Let us command their soul renew to your eternal mercy and compassion. Father, we pray that you strengthen and protect all of our military personnel who have come and who are serving presently and in the future. Give them the courage to face whatever comes. Protect them in battle and watch over their families. Lord, as you watch over us, all this we ask in your name, amen. You can sit down. To all our veterans here today, thank you for your service. And to our Vietnam veterans, we welcome you home. We have realized that there are no coincidences and sometimes things are just meant to happen. For 10 years, our organization has participated in wreaths across America, where donation-sponsored wreaths are placed by our volunteers on veterans' graves. There are no existing lists of veterans' graves. Deborah does research and sometimes we just walk the cemeteries looking for stones. We have always focused on those who gave their lives in service to our country and never returned home to their families. They should never be forgotten. In 2017, while walking a cemetery placing honor wreaths, one of our volunteers, who is also a Vietnam veteran, noticed the stone of a young man whose dates showed that he had died during the Vietnam War. That young man was Keith Duffy. His brother, Will, is here with us today. We, asked, we added Keith to our annual KIA honor roll of names, and he receives an honor wreath each year. Looking further, Deborah noticed that he served on a ship called the USS Westchester County. She saw that the survivors were planning to meet here in Westchester for the first time for their 50th reunion. She contacted them, and we were able to help with the dedication ceremony to honor each soul lost, and we have remained friends ever since. Now I would like to introduce uh, Kathy O'Connor, Commissioner of Westchester County Parks. Thank you very much, Cynthia. On behalf of the County Executive, George Latimer, I would also like to say Welcome to the veterans, veterans family, veterans friends. And you, if you know George, he'll know everybody's name in the room. I'm sorry I don't know that, but I will recognize our county legislator, Erica Pierce, who represents this area. And Lasden is very near and dear to Erica's heart. And if you know Erica, She is a true fighter for what she believes in and for the betterment of Westchester County, but she's also a true friend of the Parks Department. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. Cynthia already gave you 
why we're here and how it's come about, but I'll give you just a little bit more detail. We're also up here. Obviously, the memorial is down below, but this is our highest point and our flattest point. I also like to take full credit for the beautiful weather. <laughs> you didn't know we're living in San Diego now. Um, we do need rain, though, so be very careful. One cigarette butt can really change our world. But anyway, that being said, the USS Westchester County was a tank landing ship, which was used as a floating base, a barracks, and a warehouse during the war, uh, during Vietnam War in the Mai To River, Vietnam. The USS Westchester County transported troops and supplies between Okinawa, Japan, and Vietnam. The USS Westchester County was attacked on November 1st, 1968 at 3.22 a.m. when explosives hidden underneath uh, it were, were don't, uh, detonated, resulting in the tragic loss of the 25 U.S. servicemen. This incident marked the largest loss of life in a single incident in the Navy during the Vietnam War. Among the 25 men killed were 18 sailors, five soldiers, and two South Vietnamese service members. An additional 22 men were injured. With this monument, we honor and acknowledge their ultimate sacrifice in protecting our nation's freedoms and values. The monument serves as a reminder of the courage and dedication required to defend our country, offer at great personal loss. Thank you to Deborah Palazzo, co-founder, VP, and Cindy Abbott Kaufman, co-founder, president of the Daughters of Liberty's Legacy, Inc. And if you know either one of them, they are as uh, passionate about doing things like this and recognizing um, the people in Westchester County who have given everything for the um, betterment of our country. Thank you to the USS Westchester County Association, better known as WESCO, for their fundraising efforts. I also would like to thank First Deputy uh, Peter Tartaglia, who he and I work closely together. Um, also Jessica Schuler, who is our superintendent of this fabulous park. Um, also to the General Maintenance Division under the County Parks Department, because when you go down below, they, um, they're wonderful at a short notice. They prepared the base that the monument is sitting on. Um, and as always, they do such a beautiful job. I'd also like to recognize our Director of Conservation. Lasden is one of the facilities that is directly under Jason Klein. And I'm sorry if I'm not mentioning anybody else, um, but as I said, George would know not only your name, but where you live and how many children you have. Um, I, don't, I don't have the same talent. I also just wanted to say you're here at Lasden Park. It is such a beautiful facility. We're still in Westchester County. People forget that we're even still in Westchester County because it seems like light years away from our other parks at Tibbetts or Wilson's Woods down in Mount Vernon. But that's the beauty of our parks department, our 51 facilities, our 18,000 acres. There's something for everybody. And as I came up, there's little children still in their Halloween costumes running around, probably on a sugar high. Um, but parents come up, families come up, anybody can come up here and just enjoy the serenity. This particular trail of honor, and I had the pleasure of having my father, who is a World War II veteran, one of his uniforms is in the museum, so we're so proud of it. Uh, before he passed, I took him up here. He was, he was just blown away by what has been done here and the significance of each of the wars that are represented. So, on that note, I would like to say thank you. Thank you to the administration, as always. Uh, County Executive George Latimer, Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins, and, and the BOL, who are so supportive of everything that we do, especially here in the Parks Department. At this time, yeah. At this time, it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce somebody that I think is near and dear to all of your hearts. He lives and drinks for the benefit of the veterans, especially in Westchester County. The Director of Veteran Services, Mr. Ron Tochi. Thank you, Kathy. 
It's, uh, it's really an honor to be here today on this solemn occasion where we um, want to thank everyone for remembering, remembering what this means today, the dedication of the USS Westchester. Uh, I, uh, I'm very, very privileged. I've been privileged since uh, I left uh, the service back in the 1960s to be able to service the people who take care of us. There's no more uh, noble or gratifying position taking care of those who take care of us. So I consider it a privilege as well as an obligation. I want to uh, thank everyone, echo what Kathy said, uh, people that made this possible, but a special uh, acknowledgement to the Vietnam Vets of uh, America, Chapter 49, right here in Westchester County, who spearheaded and put this together. One of my dear friends, uh, Dan Griffin, who is uh, the acting president right now, the director, um, I, I believe is uh, probably more responsible than any single individual for pers persevering and making this happen, as well as uh, acknowledging the contribution that the county made and all the great people who maintain this great, uh, great monument. Uh, I noticed uh, you can applaud for that too. I noticed one of our dear friends, a uh, great veteran advocate, uh, now state assemblyman, uh, um, I, I see uh, Matt La La uh, Slater. I think he came in a little, uh, little, there he is. Matt, thank you for being here as always. Thanks for your support. You know, um, you can read all about what happened on that fateful day. And obviously there were so many heroes. Uh, there could be books written about every single one of those persons who served on that ship that day, especially those that uh, did not return. And a lot of people will ask, well, okay, it's great. It's in the history books. What do we need another monument for? Why spend this money, waste our time? Uh, the people that are here today, I think, really understand what we're trying to do. And I want to thank... Uh, the, uh, the ladies and the daughters of Liberty Legacy because they didn't forget and they remind us not to forget. So God bless them and they, they deserve this thing. I'm, I'm gonna tell a quick story. I know it's warm, but I think it's worthwhile repeating. Uh, back uh, when the first Persian Gulf War started, there was a, a, a story that went on the news. It was uh, first Bush president and he got a request from Make-A-Wish Foundation. There was a little fella who was, uh, I think, uh, six years old. His name was Jimmy Kalinowski. He was uh, diagnosed with brain cancer, and he only had a few months to live. And his last wish, his most wish was, I want to meet the boss of the country. <laughs> That's what he wanted to do. So with that said, it was arranged through the Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, the president was on his way someplace. He had a stop in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and they arranged a meeting where Jimmy was waiting for the president. He came out of the plane, the Air Force One, and he talked to him for a minute, took a picture, signed an autograph, and they had fun. But he was on his uh, way, I think, to the Persian Gulf, so he didn't have a lot of time. Anyway, afterwards, there was a reporter who went and interviewed Jimmy. And he said, I really, I'm happy I met him, but I wanted to go see where his house is and where he lives and so on. <laughs> so a very dear friend of mine who was a very successful contractor called me and asked me if I saw the story, and I said I did. He said, you know, I can arrange something special for that little kid if you can arrange a special tour in Washington, D.C. And I was able to do that at the time. And uh, he took his private plane and uh, he had a limousine pick up little Jimmy Kalinowski, his mom, and his little brother, who was five years old. And uh, they brought him to Westchester County Airport. And at the airport, we had a, uh, a Cessna, twin-engine Cessna, waiting to fly to Washington, D.C., where there would be a limousine waiting for them to arrive. And this little guy was in his glory. Uh, we finally arrived in D.C., Limousine picked us up, and we asked him, what do you want to do? I want to go see the boss. I want to go see his house. So we went to the, to the White House, which was arranged, and they did the tour of the White House. And after that, we asked him what he wanted to do, and he said, uh, I don't know. What else do I have around here? <laughs> and then we told him there were statues. Oh, I want to see that guy in the big chair. 
So we went over to the Lincoln Monument, and uh, he was thrilled. Boy, he's big. Look at that, you know, and so on. And um, after that, he was uh, coming down the steps, and I, uh, I've actually eliminated a couple of other stops, but this is important. Coming down the steps, I said to him, I said, Jimmy, would you like to uh, see the Vietnam Vets Memorial? What's that? And I said, it's a place where they have the names of a lot of soldiers who served in time of war. And, oh, yeah, I want to see it. So we, we walked down and we went through and we spent probably a good 45 minutes. And he asked if I knew anybody's name, which I did. And um, on the way out, uh, he said to me, uh, are all those people buried in that wall? And I said, no, Jimmy, they couldn't fit all the people buried in that wall. I said, they'd have to go to the cemeteries all over the country. And then he looked at me and he said, well, why did they die? That's a tough question to answer when you're talking to a six-year-old. And I thought about it for a minute and I said, Jimmy, they died because they loved you and they wanted you to have fun like you're having today. And there were a lot of bad people that didn't want that. Oh, okay. Geez, that's great. That's great. And and we walked out of the, the, uh, the area, and we got in the car, and I never forget this. Driving down in the limousine, little Jimmy sitting with his brother and his mom. He looked out the window, and there was a, a person sleeping on a bench. And he said, hey, Ma, Ma, look, who's that? And she said, that's probably a homeless person. And this little guy says, uh, uh, why, why don't we ask him if he wants to come with us? We have room in our house. And it almost made you cry. Anyway, we did a couple of other fun things. We went to the Mint. He wanted to see the money, how they burn it. And the line was around the block three or four times. And uh, I went up and I asked the security and I explained what we were doing and he, a special tour. And there were so many great people that really responded, un unlike a lot of things that are going on today. But anyway, when we finished, we went back to the airport. We got in a plane. And coming back at that time, you could still fly around New York City without a special clearance. It was evening, the light on the Statue of Liberty torch was lit, and I asked the pilot to fly around it, and Jimmy grabbed the pilot's uh, uh, controls, and he was in his glory. We landed, we got out, and uh, he thanked me, and he said, you're always gonna be my friend. I says, I'm gonna be your friend forever. And I hugged him, and I started to cry, and. He got in the car and drove away. It wasn't maybe two or three months later, I asked my secretary to call and see how Jimmy was doing, and she got on the phone and she started crying. And I knew right away what had happened. And I never forgot that day, and I never forget Jimmy. And it was a day, in, in, a, in a, a typical day in a six-year-old's life. He was fighting with his brother, running around. His mom was yelling at him and so on. Behave yourself. But at the same time, I think about what it meant to me. And I thought about the monument, and I thought about his question. And little Jimmy understood that that monument really meant something. It was a reminder. It was a reminder of all those thousands of people that died for what America really stands for. And I would think that this particular monument today that we, we uh, acknowledge, is a, a reminder for all those future Jimmies that may pass a monument somewhere and say, what's that? And read it and understand the sacrifices that were made by so many millions of Americans, not just the troop, but also their families to make this nation what it is today. We should thank the Supreme Commander for what we have as a gift, America. And uh, we could only hope that we keep it this way. There's a lot of good people. Uh, there's a lot of nonsense going on. It's a lot of people looking to make money and uh, exploit all our weaknesses. But at the same time, we're here today. You're all special people. And uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. God bless our troops. God bless America. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. It's only for, I'm only going to be here for a second. Okay. So I would like to introduce Paul Meyer, who served as Supply Officer of Wesco, including glasses, deployment supporting Mobile Riverine Force in Vietnam. 
After four years of active duty and 22 years in the Naval Reserve, he retired as a captain. Paul is currently the president of the USS Westchester County Association. Paul? Thank you. I want to echo Ron's comments. Everyone here today who came to honor our fallen shipmates is a distinguished guest. Thank you so much for making the commitment to join us today. A little bit of history, and I'll try not to repeat too much of what you've already heard. Uh, the Wesco shipmates had their first reunion in 1993, or 25 years after the mining. They formed the, an association to preserve the record and the naval history of the ship, and through an annual reunion, we intend to perpetuate that memory and honor those who gave their lives in service of the country to comfort family, friends, and shipmates. Each of our reunions ends with a memorial service in which the names of those killed are recited. In 2010, we placed at the Navy Memorial in Washington, D.C., a plaque designed uh, by one of our shipmates. Peter Love, Will Duffy, and Joanne Duffy put together a project resulting in the display of bricks here at Lasden Park that were dedicated in our 2018 reunion. One of our shipmates, who remains anonymous, thought it would be a good idea if we could combine the bricks here with a plaque. And uh, so our treasurer, Nolan Nelson, found a foundry in uh, the West who helped us design the plaque that you'll see shortly in bronze. And um, we, this, this anonymous shipmate said he'd cover half the cost of the plaque. Well, um, some of us wouldn't say no, and so we decided it would be good if we could raise some money from our association. So we solicited funds, and we asked our shipmates to recommend where they felt uh, the plaque and monument should be located. Well, um, as time went on, we got others involved, and then we let the people in Westchester County know about our interest. So you've heard about these folks, and some of them are standing here today, and all the veterans organizations locally, and many of you are here that I've talked to over the months or corresponded with, and we thank you for that. In all, we were able to raise nearly $38,000 and that, for a, just a, a casual effort, that was uh, very impressive to me. So today, as I speak here, we are dedicating two other plaques, one in uh, Wisconsin in Sturgeon Bay where the ship was built, and the other one in Coronado, California at the Naval Amphibious Base. But we saved the best for Westchester County, so we have the best granite, and it's local granite, from this part of the country, and we'll see it shortly. Um, when we dedicate the plaque, I, I just want to reiterate a, a few things about what happened on November 1st. Even, I, even though I was not there yet, uh, some in this audience were there, and um, the effort of the ship's crew and the soldiers really prevented a lot more uh, lives being lost and treated the injured. Uh, it was the greatest, as you heard, the greatest single combat loss of a Navy ship sustained during the, the war. There were individual awards, including a Silver Star, seven Bronze Stars, five Na Navy Commendation Medals, five Navy Achievement Medals, and 32 Purple Hearts. The ship itself was never uh, specifically recognized. The two mines exploded next to the operations and first-class berthing causing 32 Navy casualties. Therefore, the ship lost a quarter of its crew at that one moment, and nearly all of its career first-class petty officer. Those of you who serve, you understand what that means. Um, the explosion ruptured four enormous diesel fuel tanks holding 200,000 gallons and caved in a berthing compartment of 9th Infantry, killing five soldiers. Electrical power was disrupted and broken steam pipes and diesel fumes added to the chaos. 
Fuel rushed into the broken compartments. Every surface was covered with a mist of diesel oil that was ready to ignite. The air was nearly unbreathable. The ship quickly began to list to starboard and could have capsized, ignited, and who knows what else. Hospital corpsman First Class John Sullivan survived the blast and though ba uh, badly injured, cared for the trapped and wounded. He refused to be treated until the last sailor had been freed from the wreckage and no more could be done. The, the mining began a harrowing experience for many of the troops of Bravo Company. They birthed in a converted $60,000, 60,000 gallon mid, midline diesel fuel tank. And uh, it was entered through a, a hatch and passageways. And there were racks three or four high uh, down the side. And um, the story in River Currents titled Mekong Mud Dogs relates the details of, of this tale. The five soldiers who were who were trapped uh, died in their racks. The compartment rapidly filled with diesel oil and water until only a patch of air remained. And Sergeant Larry Reed entered the space twice, took command in a steady voice, and helped them orderly exit that space. Uh, there was d duffel bags, bedding, packs, broken lockers, all of that in the darkness uh, floating around in the diesel fuel. Uh, for his actions, both the Navy and Army awarded him medals for valor. The damaged area was 96 feet long and 20 feet wide. Monumental task to try to repair that and to get it watertight again. And the structural stability of the hull had been lost. Temporary repairs were completed on November 14th, but the ship had sustained so many casualties it needed to ask the squadron for help. Seven were selected among the hundred of LST sailors who volunteered. The ship undertook a 2,500-mile journey back to Yokosuka, its home port, and it had to go at only six to eight knots, which isn't really fast, compared to the usual speed of 11 to 12. Um, the landing ships of Land Shipron 9, of which we were a member, never had much slack because five months after the mining, the ship Com repairs were complete and the Wesco was underway again back to Vietnam. And um, we just want to be thankful for the perseverance and courage of all of those people who were survivors and, of course, those who we lost. Um, and I would have one final comment outside the purview of military factors was the political event that was going on. The, uh, and highlights where WESCO fit in all of this. The Paris peace talks began on earnest on October 31st, 1968, a day before the mining. If it had not been for the crew's efforts, the Navy would have lost the ship because of the Viet Cong actions. Politically, it would have been devastating to reveal how close the, the VC, not the NVA, had come to destroying the only ship the Navy might have lost in the Vietnam War. It was um, really a counterpoint to the efforts of the U.S. and South Vietnam to minimize the legitimacy of the NLF. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Peter Walton Love, Captain, U.S. Navy retired, survivor of the Wesco, search and rescue, and member of the USS Westchester County Association would like to say a few words. Please welcome Peter. I'm terribly grateful for all of you to be here to honor these people that we lost. Speak into the mic, please to honor these people that we lost on November 1st, 1968. And I want to reconfirm re what uh, Mr. Tachi had said. In addition to those remembered here today, let us not forget the over 58,000 men and women that we lost for the protection of our country. 
I also want to pay tribute to boiler technician, third class Harold Palmer. Harold uh, passed away this summer. He was a resident of Poughkeepsie, New York. Harold was a survivor of the mining and was awarded a bronze star for his helping save survivors trapped in the flooded compartments. He, along with Corman Sullivan, who received the Silver Star, entered all the flooding departments and removed those survivors that were still with us and also those people that we lost. Two of his, of uh, Harold Palmer's daughters are here today and I think we want to pay tribute to them and to him for what he had done as sort of an un, uh, a, a survivor and a patriot who deserves more credit than he has been given. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce Chet Edwards, a U.S. Navy Vietnam Mobile Riverine Force combat veteran and a witness and responder to the West Coast tragedy. Chet. I was 19 years old when I went into Vietnam. Uh, my part of the Mobile Riverine, Riverine Force was known as the River Assault Division 111. We had a home base that was anchored midstream on the muddy Mito River. This floating home base consisted of uh, the Brownwater Navy Command Ship, the USS Benoit, a barrack ship, the USS Iskari, a repair vessel, and the USS Westchester County, and two large barracks barges along with small salvage vessels and scores of armored assault craft of the Riverine Force. All were fully loaded with fuel and ammunition. That night, the Mekong River was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. Every sound was amplified over the waters of the river. This was true for the crews of the Mobile Riverine Force and those ships that made it home base on the night of November 1, 1968. My boat, an assault support patrol boat, Alpha 111-1, and several other riverine boats were on roving patrol about a mile away guarding the perimeter around our home base. At 3.22 a.m., we heard what we learned later was between 150 and 500 pounds of explosives simultaneously detonated beneath the USS Westchester County and the mobile riverine boats tied to her side. We saw a sudden flash of light that went along with the explosion. There were 175 soldiers of the 9th Infantry, many crew members of Assault Division 111 and 112, along with the full crew of the Westchester County on board. They were peacefully sleeping, or doing quiet night duty when the explosion erupted. All in all, 25 men were killed, including 18 sailors, five soldiers, and two South Vietnamese Arvin Marines. An additional 22 men were wounded. For the Navy, it was the largest loss of life during, World, uh, during the uh, Vietnam War. I found it strange that years later, I would come to live in Westchester County, which I had never heard of before. Unfortunately, our MRF boats were first responders since we were already out and on, on patrol. We had to tra transport many of the body bags and wounded into the Dong Tam base for treatment and unfortunately to the morgue. This event has never left my mind. I was saddened by the deaths and injuries but relieved that I had been on patrol duty that night out of the blast area. Kind of a conflict in my mind to be grateful, but ungrateful at the same time. Thank you.
now the reason we are all here, we will be unveiling the monument. The monument is located just down the path over here. So if you'll make your way there slowly, we'll finish our ceremony at the monument. Thank you. We are here today to unveil this beautiful memorial stone that was created by the survivors of the Westco and funded by donations. It will stand here on the Trail of Honor just below the Vietnam Memorial on the hill and in sight of our beautiful American flag. A serene and thoughtful place where people can reflect on what it means to serve in the uniform of the United States and the risks that every soldier faces. Before we unveil the stone, I want to share with you a reply we got to our invitation written to the Daughters of Liberty's legacy and the West Coast vets. It says a lot about the importance of this place. It said, I just wanted you to know how much your work is loved and appreciated by all veterans, but most of all by Vietnam veterans. I was the chapter 49 vice president of local Vietnam veterans of America in 1987 when we built the first memorial in Lasden. At that time, it was no easy task, but we hoped the site would go to serve on forever with generations as a reminder of honor and sacrifice on behalf of those who gave all. Your efforts stand as a testament to the belief held that day when we dedicated the first build, and yours will now stand with the efforts of the others. With warm admiration and regards, Joe M., Vietnam veteran, Southport, North Carolina. Today we remember and honor these sailors who gave their lives in service. When a soldier serves, so does their family. Every day they are away, there is a fear of that knock on the door. For those who lose a loved one, their service never ends. The chair at the table is forever empty. Please remember to thank a veteran, a soldier, and their family, and never forget the sacrifice they made for all of us. Today, with heavy hearts, we also remember the families left behind, which were forever shattered from the tragic mining of the USS Westchester County in those early morning hours of November 1st, 1968. I would like to mention one family of a fallen sailor from Westchester County. Keith William Duffy was a sailor from Yonkers aboard West Coast. The 20-year-old Navy radio man's anxious parents and his brother Will, then aged 15, were hoping to have Keith safe at home around the Christmas holidays as he was due for a rotation. That hope was shattered with the explosion of the USS Westchester County that had been peacefully bobbing at anchor on a river near Saigon. Keith's mother and Will's mother, B, became the president of the Yonkers chapter of the Gold Star Mothers from 1972 to 2009 and was involved in the Gold Star Memorial you will see at the end of the trail. Both parents have since passed, but Keith's younger brother, Will, is with us today. Will and his wife, Joanne, are also members of the USS Westchester County Association and assisted in raising funds for this monument. So I'd like to ask Peter and Will now to do the unveiling. Our honor roll of names is meant to remember the service and sacrifice of the 23 souls lost on the West Coast on 1 November 1968 on the Mito River. Is that correct? Yes. The Mito River in Vietnam. It will be read by Peter Love and Will Duffy. Seaman Apprentice Jackie C. Carter. Storekeeper First Class Richard C. Cartwright. Quarter Master Second Third Class Chester Dale.
my brother Keith William Duffy, radar man, third class. Single man, third class, Timothy C. Dunning. Person, person, K man, first class, David Fell. Danworth. Okay. Electronics technician, first class, Thomas G. Funk. Radioman, third class, Gerald B. Ham. Quartermaster Seaman, Floyd W. Hotelling III. Storekeeper, first class, Aristolas D. Ibanez. Yeoman, first class, Jerry S. Lenard. Radio, radio man, third class, Joseph A. Miller, Jr. Radio man, first class, Rodney W. Peters. Yeoman third class, Harry F. Rundle. Radio man, third class, Renard J. Schreiner, Jr. Quartermaster, Thomas H. Smith. Commissary man, first class, Anthony or Pacific. Thank you. Our wreath will now be our honor wreath will now be placed by Peter, Will, and Paul. Detail ready? Take charge. We also want to thank our TAPS player, Pete Gasowicz, from Vehicles Across America, Marine Infantry Veteran of Cambodian Evacuations, Vietnam Era, for joining us here today. And thank you to everyone who came out today 
to remember the sacrifices of all of our soldiers. Our ceremony has ended, and I hope that you'll join us at the main house for a light lunch. Thank you, everybody.